Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown, and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go. I've been saving for years, working overtime at the office and cutting back on luxuries. Finally, at 28, I managed to scrape together enough for a down payment on a modest starter home. It wasn't fancy, but it was mine. Little did I know my dream home had some hidden surprises. Just a week after moving in, I noticed water damage in the kitchen. It was extensive enough that I had to completely redo the entire room. Talk about an unexpected expense. But I rolled with the punches, determined to make it work. Since I was getting all new appliances, I decided to sell my old oven on Craigslist for 20 bucks. It wasn't much, but every little bit helped offset the renovation costs. That's when things got really interesting. This woman showed up in a truck with some clueless guy driving. Let's call her Karen, because that's exactly who she turned out to be. Karen greeted me and asked about the oven, confirming the price. When I agreed, she immediately tried to haggle, pointing out how old it looked. I sighed, feeling tired of the whole situation, and agreed to her lower price. Karen seemed pleased and told me, They'd loaded up. She motioned to her driver to back the truck up. That's when everything went sideways. The guy just kept reversing straight into my garage frame. There was a sickening crunch as the wood dented and the framing separated, leaving a big gap. I yelled for the driver to stop. He finally hit the brakes, but the damage was done. I was furious. After all the unexpected costs with the kitchen, this was the last thing I needed. Karen barely seemed bothered. She tried to brush off the damage, suggesting I just use some caulk to fix it. I disagreed, pointing out the extent of the damage. Karen insisted it was hardly noticeable and tried to move on to loading the oven. I attempted to negotiate, feeling my blood pressure rise with every word. I suggested she pay for the damages, but Karen refused, insisting it was just a small dent. When I pressed the issue, she stubbornly stuck to her original offer for the oven. I was tempted to tell her to get lost, but I just wanted this whole ordeal over with. Reluctantly, I agreed to let them take the oven for the original lowered price. They loaded up the oven and left. I stood there holding the measly $10, feeling like a complete idiot. That's when my partner came out. My partner noticed the damage and asked what happened. After I explained the situation, they berated me for not getting the woman's insurance information and insisted... We needed to get them back. As we were talking, we noticed something. One of the oven racks was still sitting in the driveway. These people were unbelievable. I called them, and surprisingly, they turned right around. When they pulled up, I informed them that we were calling the police to document the incident properly. Karen's eyes went wide, and they sped off before I could say another word. When the police arrived, they were able to pull up the registration and insurance information. They called Karen. And that's when things got even weirder. Karen insisted to the police that she had been the one driving, not the guy. The officer wasn't buying it and warned her that unless they both came back, it would be treated as a hit and run. Suddenly, Karen changed her tune. I ended up on the phone with her again. She pleaded with me to drop the matter, offering to send her brother over to apply some caulk. I refused, insisting that the damage needed to be fixed properly. In the end, Karen and her driver never showed up. I filed an insurance claim and eventually got $800 for the repairs. I later heard that Karen faced some pretty serious stuff, a hefty fine for filing a false police report, increased insurance premiums, and even some community service hours. You can bet I'll never sell anything on Craigslist again without being prepared for the worst. Here I am, living on a small farm with my wife, trying to make ends meet while fending off these vultures. When my wife and I decided to take in her father about three years ago, he was having health issues, and we wanted to make sure he was comfortable in his final days. We're not rich by any means, but we have a decent-sized property where we run a small farm, and we had the space to accommodate him. When he passed away two years ago, we honored his wishes and had him cremated. We didn't have a lot of money, but we managed to cover the funeral costs. My wife scattered most of his ashes under a tree on our property, keeping some in case we ever moved. About six months after his death, we started getting letters from debt collectors. We did what they asked, 
sent them a copy of the death certificate. Fast forward to a few weeks ago. I'm out in the yard getting ready to start my day's work when I see several men in suits walking up our driveway. I decide to head them off, so I go out the back door and walk around to the front of the house. I approached the men and asked what they were doing on my property. They replied that they were there to collect on an outstanding debt. Confused, I told them that our only debt was our mortgage, which we'd never missed a payment on, and asked to see their paperwork. As I looked over the documents, I noticed these guys eye my car and work equipment like they'd hit the jackpot. Then I saw the name on the paperwork. It was my father-in-law's. I explained to them that there had been a mistake, as the man they were looking for had been dead for about two years. One of the suits responded that they had no record of his death and insisted they needed to speak with him, or they'd have to take items to cover his debts. At this point, I was getting frustrated. I pulled out my phone and texted my wife to call the police and bring her dad's ashes to the front porch. I told the debt collectors that I'd contacted the person they were looking for and he'd be there shortly. In the meantime, I instructed them to wait off my property, explaining that I was the homeowner and they were trespassing. I showed them my ID to prove I wasn't the man they were looking for. They reluctantly moved off the property, but as soon as the police showed up, they drove right back on. The police officer asked what the problem was and I explained the situation. I told him these men were trying to collect a dip from my deceased father-in-law and despite of telling them multiple times that he'd passed away, they still insisted on speaking with him. I went to fetch the box of ashes from the porch. When I returned, one of the suits asked if they could speak to my father-in-law now. In response, I handed them the bag of ashes with the label showing my father-in-law's name and date of death. I reminded them that I'd told them several times he was dead and they still asked to see him. I sarcastically suggested they have a good chat and sort out the mess. I even jokingly asked them to inquire about my missing spare workshop key while they were at it. I turned to the police officer, who was trying hard not to laugh. He asked the debt collectors if they were satisfied with this evidence or if they'd be coming back. One of the suits stammered that this should be sufficient. They handed back the ashes and started to leave. The police officer burst out laughing as soon as they were out of earshot. After that incident, I installed a lock on our main gate and an intercom system. This morning, as I'm getting ready for work, the intercom buzzes. It's the same debt collection company, again asking to see my father-in-law. I grab the box of ashes and copies of the death certificate, then drive down to the main gate in my van. Two suited men were standing there with a large van blocking my gate. I explained to them that we'd been through this before and that my father-in-law was deceased. I showed them the death certificate, but they still insisted on speaking to him. So I handed over the box of ashes again and asked for their head office number. I called their manager and explained the situation. I told them their employees were at my property, insisting on speaking to my deceased father-in-law, despite being shown his death certificate and ashes. I sarcastically asked how they expected a dead man to pay his debts. The manager apologized for the inconvenience, admitting there seemed to have been a miscommunication. They promised to update their records immediately. I made it clear that I expected this to be the last time I heard from their company regarding this matter, warning that if their employees showed up on my property again, I'd be filing a harassment lawsuit. I turned to the stunned debt collectors. I suggested they leave and never come back, advising them to listen to people when they're told someone's dead to avoid future embarrassment. It's ridiculous that it took multiple confrontations and a call to their boss to get them to understand such a simple concept. I'm a 28-year-old working for a small marketing agency. I've always been passionate about art, and I've worked hard to get where I am today. My job can be demanding, but I love it. Recently, I've been pulling extra hours to finish a big project for an important client. My girlfriend and I have been together for three years. She's great, but her mother, well, that's a different story. Her mom, who I'll call Karen, has always been difficult. Anyway, last Saturday was my girlfriend's birthday. I had planned a surprise dinner at her favorite restaurant, followed by tickets to a show she'd been dying to see. 
I was excited to give her a special evening after all the long hours I've been working. Everything was set. I made reservations, bought the tickets, and even got her a beautiful necklace she'd been eyeing. I was feeling pretty good about myself. Then, the day before, I got a call from Karen. She asked if she was speaking to her daughter's boyfriend. When I confirmed, she immediately started asking about my plans for her daughter's birthday. I hesitated, not wanting to ruin the surprise, but decided to give her a vague idea. I told her I had something special planned and that it was all taken care of. Karen's response shocked me. She demanded that I cancel whatever I had planned because she was throwing a surprise party at her house. I tried to explain that I had already made reservations and bought tickets, but she wouldn't listen. She insisted that, as a mother, her plans took priority and that I could have my little date another time. I was stunned. I tried to explain that I'd spent a lot of time and money on this, but Karen wasn't having it. She ordered me to cancel my plans and bring her daughter to her house at 7 p.m. sharp, using a tone that left no room for argument. Before I could respond, she hung up. I was fuming. Who did she think she was? I decided to call my girlfriend and explain the situation. When I told her about her mom's call, she immediately asked what her mother had said, sighing heavily when I explained. She apologized for her mother's behavior and assured me that we would stick to my plans, saying she would handle her mom. I felt relieved, but the drama wasn't over. The next day, as we were getting ready to leave for dinner, Karen showed up at our apartment unannounced. She demanded to know why we weren't dressed for the party she had planned. My girlfriend tried to explain that we had other plans, but Karen wouldn't listen. She exclaimed that she had invited everyone, grandma, cousins, the whole family. I attempted to intervene, reminding Karen that we had made these plans weeks ago. This only seemed to anger her more. She accused us of being ungrateful, reminding us of all she had done for us. Then, with tears in her eyes, she turned to her daughter and asked how she could choose me over her own family. My girlfriend stood her ground, which made me proud. She told her mother that it was her birthday and she wanted to spend it with me. She suggested having a family dinner another day. Karen, realizing she wasn't going to win, stormed out, declaring that we shouldn't expect her to throw any more parties for us. My girlfriend apologized again for her mother's behavior and thanked me for standing up to her. I assured her it was no problem and suggested we go enjoy her birthday. We had an amazing night. The dinner was delicious, the show was fantastic, and my girlfriend loved the necklace. We laughed, but part of me wondered if she was actually serious. Either way, I was just happy to have survived Hurricane Karen and given my girlfriend the birthday she deserved. My mom was always obsessed with being the envy of the neighborhood. Dad just went along with it to keep the peace. My sister and I learned pretty quick that arguing was pointless. When I got married a few years back, mom immediately started hounding us about grandkids. My wife and I weren't ready but tried telling that to my mother. Every holiday, every phone call, it was always about when we were going to give her grandbabies. This Christmas was supposed to be different. My wife and I had agreed to host a family gathering for once, thinking it might take some pressure off. Mom showed up at our door two days early, suitcases in hand. She announced her surprise arrival, claiming she was there to help us prepare for the party. When I told her we didn't ask for help and had everything under control, she dismissed my words. She insisted that, as it was our first time hosting, we needed her expertise. From that moment on, it was Mom rearranging our furniture, criticizing our decorations, and guilt-tripping us about not having kids yet. The day of the party arrived and I was already at my wit's end. As guests started arriving, mom cornered me in the kitchen. She demanded to know where the grandchildren were. I reminded her that we've been over this and weren't ready for kids yet. Mom complained that she needed them for the family photo and questioned how she was supposed to show off her perfect family without grandchildren. When I told her I didn't know what to tell her, and that's just how it is, she ordered me to figure something out. She declared she wouldn't have her Christmas ruined because we were too selfish to give her grandchildren. The party was in full swing when I noticed mom was missing. I figured she was just powdering her nose or something. 
Then I heard a commotion outside. I rushed to the front yard to find mom struggling with our next door neighbor. And in mom's arms was a baby. Our neighbor's baby, to be exact. The neighbor was shouting at my mom to give back her child, calling her crazy. Mom tried to calm her down, saying there was no need to be upset. She explained that the baby was going to be in our family photo and they should feel honored. When I asked mom what she was doing, she casually replied that she was solving the grandchild problem and told everyone to gather around for the photo. My mom had actually stolen a baby for a photo op. The neighbor was in tears trying to get her child back, while mom just stood there smiling like nothing was wrong. I demanded that mom give the baby back immediately. She brushed off my concerns, saying we needed the baby for the photo. She insisted the neighbor should be grateful their child gets to be part of our perfect family picture. The neighbor threatened to call the police. That's when things really went south. Mom refused to give the baby back, insisting she was doing the neighbors a favor. My dad tried to intervene, but mom just shooed him away. The other party guests were watching in horror. I'd like to say I handled it well, but honestly, I lost it. Years of pent-up frustration came pouring out. I yelled at my mom, telling her this was insane and that she couldn't just take someone's baby because of her obsession with appearances. I ordered her to give the child back and get out of our house. Mom responded with indignation, asking how I dared speak to her that way after everything she'd done for me. I shot back, asking if she meant controlling every aspect of my life, making me feel like I'm never good enough and now kidnapping. By this point, sirens were approaching. The neighbors had indeed called the police. Mom finally seemed to realize the gravity of the situation, but it was too late. The police arrived and let me tell you, trying to explain that your mother stole a baby for a family photo is not a conversation I ever thought I'd have. Mom was arrested on the spot, kicking and screaming about her ruined Christmas. The baby was safely returned to the rightful parents, who thankfully decided not to press charges against us. They understood we were just as shocked as they were. Mom spent Christmas in jail. Dad bailed her out the next day, but the damage was done. She is facing criminal charges, and our family's reputation, the thing she cared about most, is in tatters. The irony isn't lost on me. In her desperation to project the image of a perfect family, Mom destroyed any chance we had at actually being one. My wife and I are considering moving to a new town somewhere Mom can't find us. It's drastic, but after this Christmas fiasco, I think we've earned a fresh start. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching, and see you next time.